As an artist, I oftentimes feel like when I'm painting on site, I have to wander around and find that special, spectacular view. In this case, though, what I decided to paint ultimately was right outside my doorstep. I had been walking around the landscape near Bryce Canyon in southern Utah. I wasn't really having any luck. I came back to the cabin as I'd been walking around the landscape trying to find a good place to paint, and I realized that actually this wonderful, gnarly-looking tree would be a perfect subject. The tree's really short, and it really feels like a person to me. Looking at the anatomy of this tree, I feel like there's no rhyme or reason to anything. A lot of trees have a natural rhythm of growth. Every branch, every little bump, just seems so random, and none of it matches either. The branches really feel like these hands that are being bent backwards way too far. It's got knuckles that are out of control, and I loved how haphazard that was. The trunk of this tree, it feels really muscular to me. And what's funny about it is that as you get to the bottom part of the tree, where on your average tree you tend to see roots, this tree instead, the bottom section where it connects to the ground, it just turns into this big blob. It moves downwards and it just spreads out. It almost looks gelatinous to me, which doesn't make a lot of sense given how rigid it is as an object. At the same time, the surface texture of the tree really has this wiggly, wrinkled quality that reminds me a lot of skin. This texture on the surface of the tree, it sags all over the place. It twists and it turns. It feels like it's being pulled. Another part of the scene that really convinced me to make a painting of this scene were these plump, colorful rocks that were at the bottom of the tree. The rocks look like Easter eggs to me. The colors were so pronounced and saturated. That's not something I have typically seen before. Several of the rocks definitely had earthy warm tones, yellow ochres, burnt siennas, and oranges. Some of my favorite rocks, though, were these rocks that really felt like they were purple. I think a lot of that had to do with the other yellow rocks that were surrounding them. And then on top of the color, a lot of these rocks had different patterns and textures to them. They really did feel more like eggs to me than actual rocks. My husband and kids, they oftentimes hop into an ATV and will spend an entire afternoon rock hunting and come back with this absurd bounty of rock after a day of that. Setting up to paint so close to our cabin was incredibly convenient. I can't stress enough how helpful that is. The convenience factor is not to be underestimated. It can really make a big difference in terms of your time painting. I know I've definitely been in situations where the location that I was painting was just so compromised that it really did interfere in the painting process. The only issue with the site was that there was no shade anywhere, but I really needed to sit in close proximity to the tree. So I grabbed my sister-in-law's shirt, covered myself with a big hat and said, okay, let's just do this. It can't take that long, right? It was mostly okay. Actually, the thing that was the most difficult was just the brightness of the sun was so intense that it actually was hard at times to be observing the tree. It was worth it though. I'm really glad that I found a solution to that. I also really enjoy using a rag with my watercolors. Oftentimes I'll put down this really big wash of watercolor, but maybe there's too much water in there. And so I just go back a quick pass with a rag and then I can lift some of that extra water away and also lighten that passage in value, which gives me a little bit more room to build more beyond that stroke. I have to confess that I did cheat a little bit with the setup because I loved those Easter egg rocks and I really wanted them to be very prominent in my painting. But there was this big patch of grass that was right in front of the spot I had chosen to paint because I really liked that angle of the tree. And so I went and I did a little weeding to get rid of some of that grass and that gave me a much better view. With the color of the rocks feeling so warm and saturated and playful, it was a really great contrast against the tree, which did not have a lot of color and compared to the rocks, really had almost this bluish tint to them. 
And so I decided that it would be fun to really intensify that blue on purpose, even though that wasn't literally the exact color I was seeing in the tree. And that provided a nice balance between warm and cool zones in the painting that I was really happy to have. When I sat down to do the painting, I really did not anticipate how important the grass was going to be in the painting. As I worked through the piece, I started to realize that the grass really was this glue that was holding everything together. I really liked how the rocks looked so cozy within all those soft patches of grass. It was really helpful that a lot of the grass overlapped in front of the rocks, making them feel a lot more nestled into that space. And then the grass became a natural transition from the rocks going right into the tree. I really feel like this tree is a figure that's twisting its torso, but it's twisting it four or five times in all these different junctures. And that makes for a really dynamic pose. I used a combination of art media that I really haven't done before. I decided to do a combination of oil pastel and watercolor. The watercolor was the initial gesture the foundation for the painting. As soon as I got that established, I started building the oil pastel right over the watercolor and then did quite a bit of back and forth as I moved forward developing the piece. It's really nice to do mixed media because you get to really take advantage of each material's special talents. And a lot of the times you can get one media to compensate for a weakness in another one. One of the things that's always frustrated me with oil pastel is if you're working on a white sheet of paper, there is almost always this inevitable white grain that happens. You can get rid of that white grain, but it does take a really long time. You need very thick, heavy layers of oil pastel for that to happen. And sometimes I really like the texture of the strokes that you can get with a gritty oil pastel mark. And I don't want everything so full and dense. By putting a layer of watercolor down first, once I put the oil pastel over that watercolor, you don't have that white grain anymore because you have the watercolor that's underneath it filling in that white grain. Oil pastel as a drawing medium, it's really thick and concrete. You can make really heavy marks that feel like they've got the weight of a brick. And you can really get extremely physical with an oil pastel. You can make marks that are barely touching the surface of your paper. You can also make marks that feel like punching the paper. There's an extraordinary range of what it's capable of. The thing is though, oil pastel, it's really not a very fluid material. It does feel rather blunt and textured, which is why the watercolor is such a breath of fresh air because you can be very quick, spontaneous and gestural with a very fast watercolor brush. Oil pastel really cannot move at the pace that a watercolor brush can, and that's another nice contrast. The Yolo Pastel ended up being a great fit for the rocks. I was able to throw down these patches of thick oil pastel. It let the rocks look really thick and volumetric and beefy. And then in the context of the tree, the oil pastel, I think, really gave the tree that muscular substance that I was after showing all the striations in the bark i think was really helpful the oil pastel and it was also just so fast to block in the feeling of the light and shadow with the oil pastels most of the watercolor work that i did tended to be dry brushing the dry brushing with the watercolor was so helpful especially when i was doing the grass the oil pastels are so blunt they're really not good for showing little speckles of texture. So I was so glad to have the watercolor take care of that for me. As different as the oil pastel and watercolor are, one thing I did notice was a lot of my physical actions with my hand, they were quite similar between the oil pastel and watercolor. With the oil pastel, I often find that my wrist is such an important part of that process. As I'm putting down marks with the oil pastel, I try really hard to twist and turn my wrist in all different directions. And that tends to make the marks a lot more varied as opposed to if you're constantly doing that default up and down stroke. Same thing goes with the sumi brush. When I was putting down a lot of the strokes to show the texture and movement of all the various objects, being able to shift a sumi brush stroke up and down side to side in all different directions, even within the same stroke, 
I think is so helpful, especially since the twisting was such a significant part of the gesture of the tree. I do really wish in retrospect that I hadn't added as much oil pastel as I ended up adding. I feel like I got a little bit overzealous with the oil pastel and I covered up quite a bit of the watercolor. I wish that some of that transparency in the first layer of watercolor had been more preserved because the piece does feel a little bit heavy to me. I would rather that I overdid it than not enough, but I do wish that that balance between the very washy thin watercolor and some of the thick oil pastel areas was a little bit more evident. Most of the time, I really don't paint trees that often, I guess because they're just so typical, especially if you're doing a landscape. It's very hard to do a painting or drawing of a tree that doesn't feel very generic. I guess I made an exception in this case because this tree was just so funny to me. And I knew that no matter how I painted it, it was going to look weird and wonky because that's essentially what the tree was. It's one of those situations where you feel like your subject matter is doing most of the heavy lifting. So I'm glad I had an opportunity to work on a tree and not feel like I was going to fall into a cliche image really fast. Now that I've spent several hours observing this tree and looking at the little nuances in its form, seeing the little patches of peach in the Easter egg rocks, I'm going to look at it a little differently. Every single time I go to the cabin and walk up onto the porch, I'm going to remember that experience. When you paint something, it really shifts your perception of that subject and you remember every minute and nuance of that subject. I'm so glad that every time I see this tree in the future, I'll have that to hold on to. There most certainly is a glamour to traveling far and wide to foreign countries and painting spectacular sights. But when you find something that's right outside of your doorstep, that's special in itself. While initially it might feel quite plain and ordinary because you do see it so often, little scenes like this have their own special place in our lives that I really think is worth spending time with and understanding on a deeper level. And it's just a matter of stopping and noticing what's right there at home.